You know, to go to great entertainer, I don't want to get off on a rant here, but let's face it, I want you to look around you. Everything you see is controlled either with computers or electronics of some sort. I mean, it's been written that your average car today has more computational capacity than the space shuttle, and even energy, water, air conditioning in your house, it's all electronically controlled. And all electronic controls these days are solid state and based on the transistor. So that means the transistor and its derivatives are all extremely important and, and absolutely basic to everyday life. So you'd think it'd be simple to look on the internet or somewhere and find out how they work and how they function. But everywhere you look, it's so complicated. I, they spend a lot of time telling you how a transistor is made and the physics behind it and all this sort of thing, but they don't really tell you how it works and what it does. So I want to delve into that. Let's forget about the transistor for a minute. I want to take a look at the diode. The diode was kind of discovered by accident when people were attaching wires to crystals for various reasons to determine what crystals were and how they worked. You know, they created the basic PN junction, which I really don't want to get into right now, but everybody knows pretty much what a diode is, because it's very simple. It's a bit like an electronic check valve. It allows current flow to move freely in one direction but it doesn't allow current to move in the other direction. Once again, no ranting. I don't want to talk about electron movement versus conventional current. Let's just work with conventional current here, okay? Humor me. Another way you could look at it, and the way that is important for my discussion right now, is that the diode is a component with two values of resistance depending on current direction. It either has a low value of resistance when current flow is in one direction and a high value of resistance when current is flowing in the other direction. Now this was a very curious topic for scientists, but by the 1930s and 1940s scientists now had enough physics knowledge and knowledge of atoms and neutrons and protons and electrons to figure out kind of what was going on. And that started to open their minds as to what could possibly be done with semiconductors. And like I say, you've got your diode that has two values of resistance, and they started to ask themselves questions like, is it possible to make a component that has more than two values of resistance? Now a multiple value resistor would be great, but think of it like clothing. You know, in clothing you can get small, medium, or large, and extra large, and so on. And that gives you certain choices, but it's never going to be a perfect fit. The ideal uh, resistor would have infinite numbers of values. In other words, you could make slight changes to its resistance value so that it would conform to whatever conditions you needed. It would be like, instead of small, medium, or large, you could get custom tailored clothes. I know, it's probably a bad analogy trying to, com to compare electronics to clothes. But I mean, let's face it, my, my uh, electronics teacher in the college tried to describe what a decibel was by talking about different sizes of buildings. Obviously, the two have no, nothing in common, but it's all comparative. Let me show you graphically what I mean. Let's say you have some kind of input. In my example input here, it starts out kind of smooth, then it gets kind of blocky, then it gets kind of spiky. Now, the output from my function can look like a lot of different things. It can look like all blocky or all spiky, or it can be all smooth. It really depends on what I'm trying to do mathematically and electronically to it. But what they were looking for at Bell Labs was something that looked like this. Now in our example here, the function result has the same basic shape as the input signal. Now, as you can see, it's a little bit taller than the input signal, but it's the same basic length, it's the same basic shape. 
Now, this is really what they were going for at Bell Labs. They wanted a shape for the output that would mimic the input. The output function has a one-to-one -one correlation with every value of input. And there's no surprises and there's no distortion. This is what they were really going for. Now, when you have a function like this where the output shape is basically the same as the input shape, we call this mathematically a transformation. In other words, the shape of the output is the same as the shape of the input. It may be larger or smaller or longer or shorter or something like that, but its output is predictable and it's proper, so to speak. I'm sorry to keep harping on the word transform, transformational, and all that sort of thing, but that was the big word they used to describe their planned component. So let's take a look at what they were trying to do. Their project was to build component X, the component that would have different levels of resistance based upon some input signal. So you'd have the resistor input on one side, the resistor output on the right side, and it would all change based upon the input signal coming in from the bottom there. This was their holy grail, and they wanted that resistance change to be transformational, so it would be exactly proportional to the input. To put that down in black and white, they wanted a resistor whose value changes based on the input signal and the resistance changes transformative. And in the 1940s, they did it. They created this resistor whose values changed. And it was a momentous time for physics and electronics. And they were so happy. They went up to management, management all patted them on the backs, and they said, we're gonna make thousands off of this. Maybe millions. Who knows? It's crazy. The war's gonna end soon, and we're gonna get rich. So, they went to marketing, and they told the Bell marketers, we've got a new component that's gonna change the world. It's a resistor whose value changes based on the input signal, and the resistance changes transformative. Can you believe it? And the marketing guy said, well, yeah, sure, we'll believe anything you tell us, uh, whatever you say. Uh, it's, you know, I don't know how we're going to make any money off of this, but, you know, sounds good to me. You got it, we'll sell it. Um, what do you want to call it? So the physicists looked around and they said, well, gee, you know, up until now we've just been calling it like Project 57B. Uh, well, you know what? We'll just name it after its function because that's the new technological norm in society. For instance, automobile. Auto, by itself. Mobile, moves. Automobile, moves by itself. Telephone, tele, long distance. Phone, sound. Telephone, long distance, sound. So we'll call it by its function. We'll call it the Bell Labs Transformative Changing Variable Resistor. Is that awesome or what? And the marketing guy said, Man, that's that's a mouthful. We're never going to be able to sell it called that. we got to shorten that. Can you think of something shorter? And they're like, Okay, um, how about this? The input signal is transformed into output resistance, so we'll call this resistor a transforming resistor. Marketing guy shook their heads and said, Too long. Shorten it. Okay, hmm, transistor. That's why they call this thing a transistor, because that's what it does. A transistor is nothing more than a resistor whose value changes. It transforms input signal into output resistance. Transforming resistor. A transistor is a resistor whose value changes based on the input signal and the resistance changes transformative. So let's take another look at our component X here and redraw it. This is our component X as we know it today, in the NPN flavor. 
the resistor input on the left, the collector, the resistor output on the right, the emitter, the signal input we call the base. That's our transforming resistor. And that's what I really wanted to tell you. It's that simple. All it is is a resistor. I hope you've enjoyed my little presentation and this helps you in your upcoming career as an engineer and technician. Thank you for watching. Wait, what? You don't believe me? You're saying to me it can't be that simple? You're saying, what about the NPN and the PNP and the biasing and the substrate and the silicon and germanium? What about the doping and the electrons and the holes? What about all the attachments and all that other stuff? They spent months on the, in that in class teaching me all this stuff. They didn't say anything about a resistor. What are you talking about? That's ridiculous. That's all it is. A transistor is nothing more than a special kind of resistor. That's it. It is as simple as that. I realize the underlying physics like the charge, uh, charge propagation over the semiconductor surface and the depletion region and all that sort of thing is important, but it's a bit like a person going to carpentry school to learn cabinet making and along the way they take a plant biology course so that they can learn how chlorophyll works and how a tree lives and its life cycle and how a tree's anatomy works and that sort of thing. Yes, now that's important to a cabinet maker, but how often are they going to need to know that as they're making a new chest of drawers? Probably not very often. It's good to know but it's not really necessary. And that's why I wanted to make this video because, like I say, transistors are extremely important, but everything that I've seen just about doesn't tell you that a transistor is just a special type of resistor. And it's much easier to understand how things work when you realize that a transistor is a resistor. For instance, if you get on the YouTube here and you put in a search for how a transistor works, what is a transistor, or something like that, you'll probably see a couple of videos where a person sets up an LED and a transistor and the LED is turned off. And then they touch their finger to a battery and to the base of the transistor and boom, the LED turns on again. It's not because there's some magic inside the transistor that's amplifying somehow the current from his finger. All it is is the transistor is a resistor that's wired in series with the LED. And if the transistor is sensitive enough, when he applies a tiny signal to the base from the battery to his finger, then the transistor's resistance drops and the LED turns on as the current flows. And that's it. So why didn't the guy say that? I don't know. Maybe you could drive over to Surrey and ask him sometime. Please watch part two of my What is a Transistors video to see how the transistor is used in real world everyday applications. Thanks again for watching.